Hey, Pheasant Lane fam. I hope you're doing well. My name is Robert and this is Pheasant Lane Farm. So, well look, perfect timing. This was not here last time. This moved in a couple days ago. Everybody meet Peaches. Peaches belongs to my mom. Uh, Peach is about a 14-1 pony, so uh, anything under 14-2 hands is considered a pony. So you can't get much taller than Peaches to be a horse, but if you see the size comparison against Little Man Roller, who's under 30 inches, and Peaches, who's almost 60 inches, there's quite a big difference. Peaches isn't always a peach, let's just put it that way. Peaches is a very special mare to us. Uh, my mom bought her oh, last fall sometime. She's a very intelligent horse. She just has some uh, juvenile bad habits. But the big news is, and uh, you know, a lot of things can happen in the next 10 months, but Peaches is carrying a foal. Um, we found a good deal on a stud, and I thought, you know, it'd be cool. We have this new barn. Kiddo's young. Um, she's not even in 4-H yet because of her age here in Ohio. And um, so Peaches is in full right now. She is due um, next February, I believe. Nothing like having a full in February. But I think it'd be really cool. Um, we'll raise that full up. We'll send it off for some training when it needs it um, for more advanced stuff. My family's been in horses a long time. Uh, my mom and dad have had quite a few foals, uh, my mom even more way before that. So come from a horse family and it's just exciting knowing that, you know, kind of new farm, new barn. If everything goes all right, kiddo will have, will have an, her own foal. Um, you know, once she's a four year old, kiddo can start showing it and uh, potentially have that horse up into kiddo's 30s. So Peaches is very special to us. Um, Peaches is just a little on the kid side still. But we'll get over that. Uh, she's about seven or eight years old. So she's beautiful, but uh, she's just a little butthead at times. Yeah, she knows. All right, guys. It has been a while since I put out a video, and there's good reason. I'm not going to say an excuse. Sometimes life just gets in the way. And uh, I feel like that usually has kind of a negative tone to it. Uh, I've kind of flipped the script on that. Life's just been busy lately, and I've just been trying to enjoy every moment of it. The last five to six weeks, there's been a lot of up and downs um, in my life, you know, personal life, which in turn affects my family life and, um, and the YouTube stuff that I love doing. Um, and as many of you know, or if you didn't, I'm gonna let you guys know now, um, I was in a bad work-related accident in fall of 2020. Uh, it's now April of 22, I have not been back to work yet. And um, I've known for a long time I wasn't going back to that job. So I get a lot of emails, people asking, hey, we know you're a police officer, can you tell us what happened? And I've just been putting it off and putting it off, not to be you know, secretive or anything like that, it's just, it had to be the right time for me. Uh, this is still really hard for me to talk about. <clears throat> so I figured now's the time to do it. So if you read anything in the title, which I'm sure you did, um, I don't even know what the title is going to be yet, but I'll figure out something. Um, it's probably going to be something along the lines of being retired. And a lot of people look at retirement, man, that's the end game. That's the goal. That's the light at the end of the tunnel. And for a lot of people, I'm sure it is. Uh, that was my goal. Um, being a police officer here in Ohio, I had to do 25 years and I could retire. The downside. I did seven, seven and a half, something like that years, and I was forced to medically retire. Now, I've known since about this time last year, so almost a year ago, uh, doctors told me, you know, we were hopeful that we could get your arm back to where it needed to be. It just sustained too much damage. Um, you're a liability. It's not ever going to work again. So I said, all right, and I knew this day was coming. Um, you know, you have all your doctor's appointments for workers' comp. You have all your doctor's appointments for the pension board. You have all your doctor's appointments, just your regular doctor, um, you know, surgeon and stuff like that. So it's just been really busy these last six months, or uh, six weeks, I should say. The last six months have been pretty busy just with doctor's appointments and all this stuff, traveling around the state to different doctors they want me to go to. So um, at the end of last month, I was awarded a pension and they sent the paperwork out. All I had to do was notarize it, sign it, and send it back. And I sat on it for a while. And it's strange knowing that I know deep down, and my doctors have told me, and my family, you know, supportive, 
that I'm never going to go back to being a police officer again. And some police officers I know said, hey, man, that's a great thing. It's a horrible time to be in the profession. I, I very much enjoy being a police officer. And so I'm going to take a quick time out right here. Time out. Whether you hate the police or you support the police, hey, America's, America's great. You have a right to do either. I don't need the bashing. Um, I will just say this. There are horrible police officers out there that don't deserve to wear the uniform or represent the badge. Um, luckily, a lot of those police officers end up getting fired. They get weeded out one way or another. In my career, I can honestly say I am proud of what I did. I'm proud of what I tried to achieve. And the biggest takeaway I took from, you know, seven, eight years of policing is you can't help people that don't want to help themselves. I was very fortunate to work for a very good city that, you know, if you were out talking to the kids and were shooting some hoops with them for a half hour, that was fine. As long as you took your calls, they wanted you to be out in the community. They wanted you to be a liaison. They wanted you building those relationships. And I'm very much so a people person. So that's what meant a lot to me. Um, you know, when I first started, I met some people and then towards the end of my career, you run into them again and they say, Hey man, thanks for what you did for me back in the day. So writing tickets, enforcing laws actually is a very small part of it. I don't think people understand that a very large part of policing is dealing with mental health. Um, and no, I don't believe that arresting mental health people and throwing them in jail, that's not the way to solve anything. And that's not going to solve anything, but I have a lot of opinions on it. Um, the criminal justice system, I don't think is flawless. I think there's a lot of flaws in the criminal justice system and that's just my personal opinion. So I haven't even had my 35th birthday yet and I am retired, um, which is kind of strange. But like I said earlier, I sat on my retirement papers for a while. Last week I went and got them signed. I signed them, not had them notarized. And I guess it was just kind of those meant to be moments. We have a long driveway, as many of you know, uh, I drove my truck down the other driveway. It just so happened the mail carrier was there. Uh, we've lived here two, over two years. I don't think I've ever met our mail carrier. So I personally handed her my retirement papers, talked to her for a quick moment, introduced myself, sat in my truck, and I just felt this wave of sadness. Um, and it's strange to me because I've known for the last 10, 12 months that I'm going to be retired. Um, you know, I'll have to find a new job, a new chapter starting. But it just hit me real hard, like real, real hard. Um, so I've just been kind of dealing with that, you know. Um, I miss the people I worked with. And, um, you know, like I said a moment ago, this, is, this video's got a lot of stuff, so I'm sorry if I keep backtracking a little bit. But I can gladly say I've worked at two departments in my career. The first department, there were guys there that didn't deserve to be police officers. And as far as I know, every one of them has been fired uh, along the way and no longer work in law enforcement. The department I was at most recent where I spent um, basically the whole seven years of my career, um, I can honestly say that there's no one there that was a bad officer. Now you don't have to like someone to be an officer and it's a very strange, firefighters call it a brotherhood. Um, it's very strange knowing that you can be typing reports next to someone that you really don't like or you have very differing of opinions and views on, but at the end of the day that they have your back. And I can honestly say that uh, the city I worked with, I'm not going to say the name, um, it's a great city, great employees, and I miss a lot of those guys dearly. So I guess the chapter now is what's next. And I guess the what's next now is still unclear. That has been a roller coaster like no other. When you get hurt, then you have to work with workers comp and then they try and re either re re rehabilitate you um, you know, they paid for a year and a half of my therapy, which I'm thankful for. And then once your therapy's over, you start meeting with vocational rehab specialists. I believe that's what they're called. And I think I met with three or four by now, um, two other people besides that for, for, uh, kind of some specialized things. And knowing that, you know, I had a really cool career before I got into law enforcement. Um, I was a salesman and I enjoyed it. And at times it was the best, you know, I was in my early twenties. I had a company truck. Um, it was, life was pretty gravy. I uh, didn't make a ton of money, but it was, it was just a fantastic job. And I really enjoyed the guys that I worked with back then. I was the youngest salesman by 25 years. So it was like working with three versions of, you know, a different version of your dad. You know, I was a young gun working with all these guys, um, you know, 25 years older than me. But uh, 
the big thing now is what's next. And I think handing those retirement papers to the mail lady, that was like the official closing of a chapter and the official start of a new one. So I, like I said, I've been six weeks meeting with these uh, workers comp people, sometimes three, four times a week. Um, sometime during that, I was also in my therapy three times a week. It just doesn't leave a lot of free time bouncing back and forth to appointments. This week alone, I think I have five appointments in four days. So it's just, it keeps me very busy. Um, not things I really want to be doing, but we're trying to find what's next. Now, workers comp, you know, had me go with, meet with someone and find out what my interests are. It takes college placement tests, kind of IQ tests to see where you are, all these different skills tests. And um, we kind of decided, hey, the best route for me right now is to go back to college. I have a couple degrees I can finish up in a short time. And uh, that's that. Shortly after we started that process, um, a gentleman reached out to me from a very large local company and says, hey, we think you should send your resume in. And I go, well, for what position? And he told me. And I go, I'm not even nearly qualified for that position. I don't know anything about that. Uh, I've dabbled in that a little bit, but I don't know anything about that. So long story short, um, they interviewed some people for the spot. They didn't hire anybody. They were waiting to interview me. Well, time was running out on my, you have different plans for workers comp. Time was running out on my plans and I hadn't heard back from them. And I was like, you know what? I'm not even qualified for this stuff. So I told, I called the guy back who reached out to me and he goes, Hey, he goes, it's fine. Things sometimes just don't line up, uh, with time frames and this, that, and the other. And if I didn't get hired by these guys, you know, sooner than later, then my plan I was on for workers comp would run out and it was just a giant fiasco. So I called and I formally withdrew my resume. So that was about two weeks ago that I withdrew my resume. So I'm registered for college classes this summer. Everything's going smooth. I took all my placement tests I needed to and we're good to go. Then today at lunch with my dad, I get a phone call from this company and I answer it. And they said, hey, we really want to sit down and talk to you. And I go, well, I formally withdrew my resume and they go, we don't care. They said, uh, we were at some conferences, we were busy, some, we were on the guy was on vacation, um, it's been crazy, we're chasing this big project right now. Um, we want your skill set. And I kind of said, for what? And they said, well, we're not sure yet, but we know we want your skill set. There's a couple different places we think we could fit you in. Um, and so the guy made me feel really welcomed. He said, give me two days, I'm gonna call you. We're actually having a meeting to talk about you tomorrow. Okay, so we will see how that goes. So it's just, you know, at first I was excited about this job opportunity and then I was excited to go to school and I thought going to school was my path. And then this company calls back. So like I said, it's just been a roller coaster. Um, and this spring is the first time I've kind of set back and I've tried to go fishing again and um, just enjoy life. We have two boats. I think one of them was on the water two times last year. The other one never left my dad's garage. So I've been trying to you know, get out and do some things that I used to do that I enjoyed that I haven't done in the last year and a half. Um, it's too wet around here to do projects right now. That's why the horses are in right now. It's like it dries out for two days and we get four days of rain. It dries out for two days, it gets four days of rain. It's too wet to haul stone. It's too wet to do anything else around here. So I've been trying to just enjoy myself. Um, you know, I cleaned the garage the other day and, you know, um, just doing small things, maintenance on the trailers and this, that and uh, getting out and trying to go fishing. So I've been getting a lot of emails on the fishing videos. We did a few when we first started. And uh, I think there's gonna be a lot more of that stuff. So there'll be more fishing videos. Uh, already this year, we've had boat issues with both boats. One's a 2018, one's a 2017. We've had zero issues until this year. So there'll be a whole video on that. But I know the thing a lot of people have been asking me is what happened to your arm? Now, I think now is the time to talk about that. Like I said, I haven't been, be a, I haven't been being secretive about it. It's just really hard for me to talk about. Um, I tell people like, you know, uh, like, hey, how you doing? And I go, hey man, you know, I got my arm, I'm still good. And my wife will kind of look at me and be like, what are you talking about? You're still alive. So um, I had multiple doctors tell me I shouldn't be alive because of the accident I was in. And um, now's the time to talk about that. So I'm gonna try and keep this video 25 minutes. We got about 10 minutes to go. 
and just tell you exactly what I went through. So you guys know I was a police officer, I was injured, and uh, I've just been in physical therapy and trying to get back into a new career. I feel like I need a purpose. I've kind of been losing that. Um, I feel like my purpose the last 18 or well, 16 months is keeping things going on this farm. A lot of things I couldn't do, I had to pay to have them done. But uh, we gotta keep making progress moving forward. That's why we bought this barn. The person that did this to me, I wasn't gonna let her win by having that person stop my dreams that Amber and I have for kiddo. So we went forward, we, moved, we built this barn, and uh, very thankful to have a lot of help from family and friends. Um, the guys that built this barn did a fantastic job and they didn't charge me near enough. So very, very thankful for great family and friends. So I guess uh, now's the time to get into it, huh? All right, this is gonna be the extremely condensed uh, version it's a very long story, but I want to try and keep it under 10 minutes. So, October of 2020, fall, pretty close to Halloween. Um, another officer was dispatched to a private property accident. So an accident that doesn't happen on the roadway happens in a parking lot. Uh, here in Ohio, the reporting system is totally different for that. It might be that way in other states, I don't know, but you know, I'm just going to talk about what I do know. So, another officer was dispatched to that. Something happened, that officer couldn't go. I got on the radio, I was in charge that day. I said, hey, you go do that, I'll go do this accident report, I'll catch up with you later, no big deal. So, long story short, a drunk driver attempted to leave the scene of an accident. Um, at one point, I was next to that vehicle, hoping that vehicle was gonna stop, I was on foot. That vehicle kind of slammed on the brakes real quick, kind of caught me in a stutter step. Next thing I know, the vehicle is cranking the steering wheel towards me, and just you just hear the engine taking off. So the vehicle is kind of coming into me. Um, I didn't want to get run over by the rear wheel, so I tried to back away from the vehicle and push off the door jam. Here's where things went to uh, no bueno real quick. A uh, window was down on that vehicle, my hand slipped off the door jam and got wedged behind the driver's headrest. Now on a vehicle that's basically flooring it, it there was no time to get my arm out. Um, I tried, just wasn't gonna happen. Um, part of this is on video, I'm not gonna show the video. Um, I didn't watch the video until I was forced to watch it last October, a year later before trial. Um, I don't ever wanna see it again. I live that over and over and over in my head, so I don't wanna see it. But I will tell you this, coworkers told me I look like a cartoon, just a blur of blue. Um, so that individual is taking off down the road and you don't have a lot of options when you're hanging out the driver's side window of someone's vehicle with your arm wedged up and behind um, inside of a vehicle. So I went through the playlist, playlist real quick, kind of a checklist. What are things I can do right now to stop this threat? Can I stop this vehicle? Well, there's no way that you're going to jerk the steering wheel one way or another. People have told me that. Why don't you just jerk the steering wheel? Well, one way I'm going into a creek, the other way I'm going to go into head-on traffic which is not good either one for me. Uh, I've had people say, why don't you kill that person? Well, at one point in my mind, that did, you know, less lethal did come to my mind. I don't think shooting someone who's driving a speeding car is going to benefit me hanging out the window. Now, I don't get politics or religion into my videos. Um, people have a right to think whatever they want, and that's what makes the United States of America a great place to live. But I will say this. After I run through that checklist in my head of things I can do, which I wasn't hooked to this vehicle very long, but it seemed like forever. Um, I remember like just like call, like like telling myself just calm down, figure out everything will be all right. So I'm going through the options in my head: steering wheel, how to get my arm out, this, that, and the other. Uh, at one point in time, everything goes silent, like someone just hit the mute button, and. Time really slowed down, which is very strange for me even to this day. As clear as day, in my right ear, I heard someone tell me, you're about to die and it's okay. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, has messed me up for a long time. Silence, volume gets shut off, someone tells you, you're about to die right now and it's okay. Boom, next thing I know, everything goes white I don't remember, I never lost consciousness, I never closed my eyes that I can think of. Next thing you know, everything goes white, and I feel like I'm a little kid who fell off the road riding, or fell off my bike riding down the road, instantly just get the wind knocked out of me. Then I realize, okay, I'm rolling down the road. 
I tell myself, I'm rolling into oncoming traffic. So I remember my stepdad taught kickboxing. He was in a couple motorcycle accidents. He was actually run over by the FBI in Sturgis, South Dakota back in the day. Now, that's a funny story. But um, I remember a lot of things in the academy and what my stepdad had told me is if you ever hit the road or you do anything, you gotta protect your head. So I remember putting my left hand up, trying to protect my head. And I remember rolling down the road, just thinking, oh shit. That's all I could think of. And at this point in time, I don't, I'm not in any pain. I don't, I don't hear anything. Everything's just on mute. Except for the fact I start hearing the very clear signs of sticks breaking. And I remember thinking that's an odd sound to hear rolling down the road. Well, as I roll down the road a few more times, I realized that my right hand is coming up and punching me in the left face and then going back and punching me in my left kidney. Then I realized those sticks breaking were my arm. So I'm trying to protect myself now from the road and from my wild uh, Mike Tyson fist hooking me in the face. And I come to rest on the roadway, across the roadway with my hands crossed, um, laying on my back, very weird place to come to rest. And I remember looking up at the sky thinking, okay, someone just told me I'm going to die, what's next? I remember it was a beautiful October day. I remember I didn't hear anything. I felt warm. I was just laying on the ground, looking at the sky. And um, I lay there for a few moments and then someone runs over and basically jumps on top of me and says, officer, officer, I'm first aid certified. Do you need CPR? That's the first thing I heard since I heard those other phrases a few moments earlier. And I remember telling the guy, no man, I'm not dead. And then it kind of hit me, oh, I'm not dead. And just like someone turned on the faucet of sounds, I heard people screaming, people yelling, tires squealing, people honking their horn, and it was just like a sensory overload. So I lay there for a few moments. Luckily, I kept my microphone on my chest. With my left hand, I grabbed it and I said, hey, officer down in the street. Dispatcher at the time has actually been my best friend for the last almost 20 years of my life. Uh, we met freshman year in college and I've uh, been best friends ever since. So hearing the tone in his voice, dispatch, other officers and the medics was a little strange. Now, laying in the roadway, I hear the cavalry coming. I hear cruisers just flying on the road. And uh, that's a good sound to hear. I hear a cruiser door slam shut and I look over as far as I can turn my head, I just couldn't move my body. And I see feet running up. Now, Remember earlier in the story when I said that uh, I told that one officer to go take that other call, I would take this? Well, that officer was my little brother. And um, sitting there, laying there on the road, I'm like, dear God, don't let it be my brother. First officer on scene was my little brother, which uh, to this day screws me up a little bit. Just seeing the look of terror on his face. And I didn't know it at the time but uh, if you guys watch police shows or this, that, and the other, a lot of times you can't get in an ambulance unless you have all your weapons taken off you. And that's something an officer never wants is someone to touch his weapons or take them off of him. And I remember my brother looked at me and said, sorry, as he reached down, uh, he took my SIG pistol from me and my taser. And just the look of sheer terror on his face. And uh, I said, hey man, Call mom and dad and call Amber. And um, that was pretty much the last time I saw my brother. I was in charge that day. Yes, they did allow two brothers to work on the same shift. Um, they hired me a year later to the day they hired my brother. Um, the department really wanted him. It's a decent size of department. And they said, hey, we've never had two brothers work together. They've had married couples in the past. And I said, hey, if my brother screws up, I will not lie for him. And if I screw up, he will not lie for me. And uh, that was true our whole career. And um, so instantly that day when I was in charge and this accident happened, my little brother was in charge. And which I'm sure was really hard on him because it's hard to see a loved one go through what I went through and then have to be the boss instantly, organize everything. It was, I'm very proud of him for what he did that day. So they load me up on a stretcher. They put me in an ambulance. They cut my jacket off. And uh, this was kind of funny, but I had a short sleeve uniform shirt on and one of those uh, kind of knockoff North Face soft shell jackets. 
And um, sorry, medications are getting to me a little bit. Um, and one of those knockoff soft shell jackets. Funny thing is they think that soft shell jacket helped save my life, but especially my arm. Now, when I got in the ambulance, they cut my jacket off. I hear them say we have blood. I hear just sounds like not water running, but uh, maybe rain. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're like, we have blood. Well, as I was rolling down the roadway, all my bones and my humerus sma uh, got smashed. My elbow cup got smashed. Bones were just popping in and out of the back of my arm. Well, when they took my coat off, instantly all that blood just started hitting the floor. Well, you can't put a tourniquet on someone whose arm is destroyed. So uh, one of the things that kind of haunts me is one of the assistant fire chiefs, or I don't know, they keep changing their titles. But someone I've known, so the whole time I've worked for the city, uh, he gets in charge, he's in the back of the ambulance. And I just remember he was in an N95 mask and just the look of terror on his face. And I called him by his first name and I said, am I going to be okay? And uh, he shook his head no and walked away. And then I thought, oh, this is, uh, this is not good. So I thought, okay, broken arm, six, 12 weeks, I'll be back to work. Well, fast forward to the hospital, which uh, if you want to feel every crack in the roadway, have a destroyed arm and... Uh, take you up to the hospital. To tell you how destroyed my right arm was is when we're in the ambulance and they're trying to get IVs in me and they're trying to stop the bleeding, I looked at the one guy, I go, I gotta move my arm. And he goes, what are you talking about? In my mind, my arm was bent up behind my head because that's how my shoulder felt. I said, is my arm behind my head? And he goes, no, your arm is laying on the floor of the ambulance. So I literally had to have them, if this is gruesome, pause for the next five, 10 seconds. Um, I asked them to pull my arm out so I could rotate my shoulder down. And it was just crunching and clicking and the worst pain I've ever experienced in my life. So that's how jacked up my arm was. There was nothing holding the lower portion of my arm to my shoulder um, except soft tissue and some tendons and skin. So to get me to the trauma center, I guess I'm in pretty bad shape from what, uh, I thought I just had a broken arm. I didn't find out until after the fact, someone had called my wife and said, uh, we know his arm is destroyed, but also possibly broken right shoulder, broken right hip, pelvis, leg, and ankle. Now, um, and they said, and on the bright side, he doesn't appear to have a broken back or brain damage at this time, but we do not know. So I was pretty jacked up. Um, Thank God every day that I'm alive. I'm thankful that I've had a second chance. The hard part about this is when you think you're going to die and you don't, every day you question that. Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And uh, that was real hard for me. Um, to this day, I struggle with that. I've had a great team of doctors and nurses. My physical therapist, Caroline and Troy, I would not be anywhere where I am today if it wasn't for those guys. Um, when I first started doing physical therapy, my arm was like 20 or 30 degrees range of motion. Less than, I think it was 18. This is as far as I could move my arm for months. And um, there was times where I would have to lay on my left arm while they stretched and tried to manipulate my right arm just so I wouldn't cold cock them across the face. Um, I've cried at physical therapy, but I'm glad where I am today. So on top of that, I know this video is going long. What the hell now, right? Um, on top of all the, medic, the the physical stuff I went through, the mental stuff was really trippy for me. Um, I've never hated someone as much in my life as I did this person that did this to me. Um, that person thought this was, at least from my opinion and from evidence I saw, that person thought this was all just a big joke, um, thought she was innocent. 
Um, she was facing 19 and a half years. She got six. It is what it is. It's not my job to judge someone or sentence someone to prison time. Um, I'm not mad about that. It is what it is. I hope this person can get her life switched around um, and knowing what she almost took from me. So someone who's going to sit there and laugh at you and then get sentenced and leave courtroom that day knowing she's going to prison. She wasn't laughing then. Um, this was all real. She was facing four counts. She was found guilty on all four charges. And um, every call you take as a police officer, you can look back and go, I wish I would have done one or two little things different. You know, nothing's ever perfect. There were things that could have been done differently that wrong day, that day, different, differently. There could have been things done different on that call. Um, but I don't regret anything that happened. And honestly, I can say, I'm glad it happened to me and not my brother. That's just brotherly love, you know? So it's been a long ride. It's been rough. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I think guys, especially, and especially people, people in the law enforcement, uh, firefighter, EMS thing, we see some really bad crap and we don't ever want to talk to anybody about our feelings. And uh, I met a great psychologist. It took me a few tries. The first ones I spoke to, I'm like, they're idiots. I'm not talking to them. Um, you know, I have a hard time trouble sleeping. Hard time trouble. I have a hard time sleeping um, most nights between the pain in my arm, which will never go away. Um, and then just bad nightmares or reliving it. But if you're having some issues, man, go talk to somebody. And I know a lot of people don't. I've tried to get my brother to go talk to someone. Uh, my brother's that tough guy, you know. He's a, he's a great police officer. He's a great person, a great friend. Um, but there again, you can't make people can't make people do things they don't want to do. I wish at some point in his life he'd go talk to a counselor about what situation we went through, kind of talk through it. But it's been a rough road. Um, to date, I've had two major surgeries. I have 22, I believe, 25 screws on my arm, three metal plates, and. Uh, for a long time, I was hoping to go back to doing what I wanted to do. And when the doctors just tell you it's not going to happen, um, I'm kind of glad that they made the decision for me, uh, to be honest. Um, one doctor told me that uh, you're basically a clay pot that was taped back together. If that clay pot breaks again, there's no putting it back together. So uh, I guess my arm is, uh, I'm going to start calling it Humpty Dumpty. Maybe I should get a tattoo, Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. But, um, you know, they estimated I hit the pavement between 45 and 50 miles an hour is what uh, someone had told my wife in the hospital. And um, in the hospital, I'm a little bit of a smart ass at times. And um, so they rush you to the, to the trauma center. They rip off all your clothes and they're poking and prodding you and you're trying to tell them that you're alive. And I feel like they don't even listen. Anyways, they rush me to a bunch of tests. At this point in time, I didn't know that they thought all these other bones in my body were broken. And I remember a nice female doctor, and they were rushing me from test to test, trying to get my arm to stop bleeding. Um, I said, hey, ma'am. And she looks at me. She goes, yes, mister. And I go, are you going to, this was in that October. I said, are you going to have, can I hunt the second split of duck season? Duck season's for a while. It takes a break. And then we call it the second split. And uh, I was honestly being a little honest, maybe a little bit smart ass. And this doctor chewed into me, running alongside me. So I give her credit for that. She goes, you shouldn't be alive. You hit the pavement at 50 miles an hour, whatever it was. You're lucky you didn't get hit by oncoming traffic, which I'm very thankful someone wasn't texting and driving um, or they would have got hit by a car. That's a hell of a way to die too. After you fall off a car, get hit by another one. Um, so she basically chewed me out for like those 30 seconds running between rooms to get tests done. And that, uh, you know, I'm probably going to lose my arm, but I'm thankful to be alive. So that's that. Um, when I went into surgery the next morning, they were finally, it took them 12 hours to get the bleeding under control. The surgeon is very good. He's a fantastic guy. I actually have to go talk to him tomorrow. He came to see me before surgery and he said, I'm going to do all I can to save your arm. He goes, I'm a good surgeon. My work speaks for itself. I'm not bragging, which I respect that. He goes, but right now there's a 50, 50 chance you wake up from surgery. You won't have an arm. Okay is what it is i guess i mean i i wasn't in any position to argue um so when i woke up i was uh 
there. They couldn't put an exoskeleton on me because all the bones. There were so many broken bones in my elbow. Uh, they had to cut four inches off my ulna bone, pull it out during surgery so they could get up to put all the pins and plates in here, and then they had to pin that bone back on. Uh, that was in the end of October. February, of this, the next following February, a few months later, I went in. I was having extreme nerve issues. They went in. They cut out my ulnar nerve, which, nerve, which is your funny bone nerve, and they rerouted that, trying to make things feel better. Um, I could move my arm a little better. My ulna had actually got stuck in some scar tissue, but... Uh, I had to sleep in our spare bedroom because I would cry for nights on end. Um, just constant, constant funny bone pain. Now, if you've ever whacked your funny bone, you know that pain, right? Well, my nerve was so destroyed that my funny bone pain was my ring finger and my pinky, about halfway down my forearm, constant. Like someone just has a ball peen hammer just tapping it every 15 seconds. Um, I'm still on nerve meds. I don't want to be. Uh, Gained a little bit of weight since of all of this, um, and then I'll you know I'll lose some weight, and then I just think it's the nerve meds. It's a big side effect. I want to get off of them completely. The way things have been going with the nerve issues, not like I wanted them to. The only option is for them to keep upping my nerve meds. So it is what it is. Uh, I hate that saying, but I feel like it fits a lot here. So that's about it. Um, you know, I was in the hospital for about a week, and back to the funny, the knockoff North Face jacket. They told me if I didn't have that jacket on, I would have probably, you know, high percentage lost my arm because of the infection of bones going in and out of the arm, touching on pavement, dirty pavement. So that knockoff jacket is what had saved my life, or at least my arm from infection. They're actually more worried of me dying due to infection than they were um, the trauma that my body sustained. So... That's that guys. There's really no way to shorten this video up any longer. I apologize. Um, but since October of 2020, I've had an outpouring of support from people on YouTube. And that's why we call this a fam. This is a family. Kiddo gets mad if I call it Pheasant Lane family. That's why it's Pheasant Lane fam. But uh, there's been an outpouring of support. I've met, you know, a good buddy, David from Pennsylvania. Chris, uh, who doesn't live too far from me, but I met on YouTube. Um, Gary, if you guys haven't... She's a pig. She's out of food, so now she's a grumpy. Peace, knock it off. So, um, Gary, if you guys haven't subscribed or watched Tractor Talk with Gary, he's out in Iowa. Gary called me last week. We've actually exchanged phone numbers. We've talked uh, the last year or so. Gary had a son who was... Uh, really having some rough medical conditions the last two weeks actually longer than that about two weeks ago they got figured out or no i talked to gary about two weeks ago last week i saw that they got some things figured out we were praying for his family um but gary is a great guy go check out his channel tractor talk with gary uh, he ordered a brush guard from zooks i paid zook some extra money to make it cool and surprise gary uh, without him knowing so um just good people i appreciate everything that you guys have emailed me and messaged me and support you've given myself and my family it's been a rough ride um thankfully the city paid me for a year my regular paychecks workers comps paying me now um so it's less money than what i was making but hey you know it is what it is and um there it goes again um so i'm thankful to keep having a paycheck we had some money set back that's why I, when lumber spiked last fall or dropped last fall i said go ahead and build the barn kiddo needed this barn i think i needed a big project in my life and it's just how things worked out so from the bottom of my heart i want to say thank you guys again for all the support if you have any comments emails shoot them below um, you can email us at pheasant lane farm one word pheasant lane farm at gmail.com and i appreciate looking at those um, there's gonna be some more fishing videos coming out guys uh they're 400 hour i'm over like 420 hours on the Kubota, so that video will be coming out i gotta service the tractor and the lawnmower um dad and i just put a kicker on the walleye boat so we'll be doing that um so just living life so from my family um and my heart thank you so much for all that uh you do when you watch these videos I'm sorry sometimes I burp. That's the meds I'm on. I can't do it. I'm sorry I started tearing up there. This is real hard for me to talk about. But uh, 
I'm gonna go up to the house, get some things done. Kiddo's under the weather today. Amber works from home, so I better get in there and start pulling my share. So we'll take care, everybody. God bless. And most importantly, make smart decisions.